The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided that the Nobel Peace Prize for 2009 is to be awarded to President Barack Obama. Drone strikes in Pakistan, the surge in Afghanistan, the bombing of Libya, aiding terrorists in Syria, crippling sanctions on Iran, the Asia-Pacific pivot. Here in 2014, the Nobel Committee's 2009 decision to award Obama with a peace prize seems like some sort of sick joke. But then, to those who were warning that Obama was just a fresh face for the same oligarchical interests that Bush had served so well in the eight years before him, the hope and change pandemonium of the 2008 selection cycle was always a sick joke. One look at the largest donors to Obama's campaign was enough to confirm exactly who he was working for, and exactly what type of hope and change the public could expect. So why did people believe in it so fervently? Surely wishful thinking played a role. A public that had just survived eight years of Bush-era insanity could perhaps be forgiven for desiring change so desperately that they were willing to see it in Barack Obama, a clean slate upon which they could project whatever fantasies they wished. But the problem is deeper than that. As we examined last week on the eye-opener, the fraudulent left-right political divide has been used to keep the people divided against each other even as it is used to dupe the public into supporting the very same political agenda through puppet administration after puppet administration. Perhaps nowhere is this process of divide and rule quite so transparent as it is in the so-called anti-war movement of the last decade. At the height of the Bush administration, scores gathered for protests, marches, rallies, and acts of civil disobedience to decry the acts of torture, abuse, and violence being perpetrated by the Pentagon in the name of the War on Terror. At the time, the movement was dismissed by the talking heads on the right side of the political aisle as being little more than an anti-Bush movement. If we refuse to be silenced and frightened by the high-class thugs across Pennsylvania Avenue, if we stop being stereotypically good soldiers and good Americans, if we do what history demands in this critical hour, we can get our troops home now. We can put an end to the suffering and to the war crimes. We can begin to absolve our complicity. And we can give George Bush an accountability moment he will never forget. As it turns out, they were largely right. After the election of Obama in 2008, the driving impetus of the anti-war movement evaporated. No longer did it matter that the wars, covert operations, military tribunals, and prison torture camps were continuing. In fact, it did not even matter that American military involvement escalated with the Obama handover, expanding into Pakistan and Yemen, involving more drone strikes and extrajudicial assassinations. This was, after all, a Democrat, and so many on the anti-war left were appeased. Groups like Veterans for Peace which had so loudly and so admirably called for the impeachment of Bush for his participation in war crimes and atrocities, have been happy to look the other way while their guy in the White House forwards the very same agenda. Last year, I had the chance to talk to famed activist and writer Larry Pinckney, a veteran of the original Black Panther Party, about the process by which the anti-war movement was co-opted and ultimately squashed by the left-right political fraud. You know, there were... Uh, hundreds of thousands, if not more, people who righteously protested against the outrageous actions by the G.W. Bush regime. However, these same people, or many of them, if not most of them, have become deafeningly silent about not only what uh, Obama has done in terms of carrying on these uh, Bush-Cheney policies, but the fact that Obama has expanded these policies. And let me be specific. I'm talking specifically about uh, the drone missiles where he's killing at will people in other countries at will, just killing them. And that includes uh, infants, babies, women, uh, children, men, old and young. I'm also talking about the NDAA section 
uh, provision 1021 of the NDAA, uh, where Obama has the power to, uh, to in fact, kill U.S. citizens, which he has done, quite frankly, whether people know it or not, he's done it abroad. Uh, but he can kill them now or kill us now uh, on U.S. soil. And probably it has been done before, but it has become legally codified by the Obama uh, uh, regime. And, you know, I, I'm just naming a, a, a few things as to the outrageous uh, atrocities that this man is, is, is commit, this man and his minions, he's by no means alone, uh, they are committing against everyday, ordinary people of this nation and of the world. So when we think of the NDAA, when we think of the kill list, his infamous kill list every Tuesday deciding who am I going to kill today, when we think of the fact that uh, Obama approximately five years ago received, most undeservedly received, the Nobel Peace Prize. Think about that, folks, the Nobel Peace Prize, and yet he's a warmongering, warmongering president, probably the most warmongering president that this nation has ever had. We need to get real. We need to be honest. We need to step out and say no more of this insanity. As vexing as this endless cycle of left-wing and right-wing warmongering is, the sick joke is set to be played on the public yet again, and, what's worse, it seems to be working yet again. This time it's the Republicans who are pretending to play the role of savior, putting up a mock opposition to the worst abuses of Obama. There were protestations over the way Obama bypassed Congress to start the war in Libya. It is now official Republican platform policy to decry illegal NSA surveillance as an abrogation of fundamental rights. But come November 2016, after the next predetermined, rigged, phony American coronation spectacle plays itself out, and a man or woman with an R next to his name is inevitably installed in office, the Republicans will once again be fine with any level of presumed presidential authority, and the Democrats will once again pretend to be concerned about executive overreach. And the public, relieved to have thrown the rascals out yet again, will be content for another four or eight years, until the next time they decide to throw out the rascals. And so history repeats, and repeats, and repeats, and repeats. And yet, there are reasons to believe that this time can be different. As Larry Pinkney highlighted last year, there are concrete steps that the public can take to help transition away from the left-right duopoly and toward a system where people collaborate and act in their shared interest against the wishes of the warmongering ruling class. We begin with ourselves. We begin by understanding that the corporate stream media are nothing more than propaganda arms of the, the, the power elite of the system. We must, one, create our own everyday people's media. We must look to that media and not only look to it, but be an integral part of that everyday people's media. Uh, pass, tell our own story. In other words, tell our own narrative. Two, number two. We must do as Joe Hill, the famous activist, the late Joe Hill, many years ago said, we must stop mourning. It's, it's not about mourning and holding our heads down. Oh, uh, no, it's about organizing. It's about reaching out to each other, dispensing with these fake left-right paradigm labels and struggling together collectively for our common interests as everyday, ordinary people. My point is this, that we have to understand that the power and the responsibility for this insanity rests with us, everyday black, white, brown, red, and yellow people in this country and throughout Mother Earth, throughout the world. So those are two 
beginning points that we can do immediately. We don't have to wait for any. We can do that immediately because it begins with ourselves. What's more, there is reason to believe that this is actually happening. No more stunning example of a genuine, grassroots, people's anti-war movement can be identified than the spontaneous mobilization we saw in the wake of the false flag chemical weapons attack in Syria last August. It was the grassroots alternative media that raised the alarm about the push to war and the US-British manipulation of intelligence to try to lay the blame for the attack on Assad's doorstep. It was mass mobilization and anti-war campaigning that derailed the war drive and forced Obama to back off from sending troops into yet another war theater. And it was this intense public backlash that ultimately shamed the administration into taking Putin's face-saving deal. Compared to the mass carnage that has been inflicted in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and elsewhere over the past decade, the aversion of the Syrian war may seem like a small victory. But it nonetheless is a victory, and has to be recognized as such. The fact that NATO did not begin the bombing of Syria in 2013 may prove to be the beginning of a tidal change of resistance to the imperial, bankster-driven war agenda of the warmongers on the left and right sides of the phony political divide. Or it might turn out to be a momentary blip on the otherwise unimpeded journey toward a state of total war. The people might go back to their mainstream news, believing their mainstream lies, voting for their mainstream political parties, and thinking that as long as it's our guy in office, everything will be okay again. In the end, the choice is ours to make. But with war on Iran and a World War III scenario involving China and Russia looming on the horizon, the time to make that choice may be running out. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.